So we're going to go through a bit about patient positioning for sinus surgery. Um, as you can see in this room, the patient's already been turned from our anesthesia colleagues. I like to go 180 degrees, uh, 90 degrees in certain rooms is also uh, okay and preferable. Typically the patient's placed at an incline, we'll go reverse Chandelenburg. I like it to be at least 15 degrees, we can be changed a bit based on your height. We typically do it so that our elbows are roughly at 90 degrees as we work. So height roughly like this is okay for someone of my height, but it can be adjusted a bit based on your particular height. Other lines, we usually have the endotracheal tube taped at the left lower lip. As we work through the nose from the patient's right side, that allows us full access uh, to the nose without having impingement from the endotracheal tube. You also note that the eyes are covered with uh, tegaderms, either clear fever tegaderms are preferable. These will be exposed during surgery so that as you operate along the orbit, especially the ethmoid cavity, you can easily palpate the eye to ensure sure you're not having any entrance into the orbital space. We typically tuck the right arm as you can see here. Uh, most of us are right-handed surgeons, uh, and even if you're left-handed, typically we still operate from the patient's right side. Having this arm tucked here will allow you to to the patient, and usually the left arm is out in case there's any work needs to be done from the anesthesia standpoint with IVs, etc. The last thing I'll mention is the location of the screens here. You want to have to be in a position that's comfortable for your neck and your head. Typically that's a position going over the patient's left ear. You want to be roughly at your eyesight level so you're not turning your neck or cranes as comfortable you operate. And my preference is to have the uh, navigation screen just to the right of the endoscopic screen here for easy access during the case. I did want to point out the micro debrider pedal. It has a number of functions. The first thing I'll mention is that the center button here simply turns on and off the micro debrider, as you can hear there. So with the micro debrider, uh, this will change uh, the opening location. So if you spin this circle, it'll spin that around in 360 degree circle. And when you have an angled debrider, this will also lock it or unlock it so it can, can or can't turn the shaft in your hands. Okay? With our buttons, we have a delta button that opens and closes this with about a quarter uh, turn. So I'll hit that delta button on the right side and you'll see this change about a quarter turn. And then again, partially open, fully closed as you can see there. Partially open there, then fully open as well. So it just simply oscillates or turns that uh, by quarter turns allow you to open or close that as you go in and out of the nose. Then our circle button with the arrows will allow us to change the RPMs on the machine. Typically at the, at, for baseline use we use it between 3 and 5,000 RPMs and it's oscillating as you can see highlighted in the lower right there the OSC button. It can also be placed on forward uh, which is things like when you use a drill uh, you can go ahead and put that on a forward motion only. When you hit the button it can, it can change between the RPMs you can see here I'll hit it once it goes up to 12,000 RPMs in a forward motion and I'll hit it again, it goes back to 5,000 RPMs in an oscillate motion. And depending on what settings you prefer, you can change those so that it goes through several different settings uh, throughout the case. The next thing we'll go through is the equipment and how to sort of set it up and use it. Um, typically, I'll start with the endoscopes and I'll go through them sequentially here. Uh, Robin's already set up a zero degree endoscope as you can see here. We typically use Carl Storrs endoscopes, these are four millimeter. And if you're not sure, Typically the zero degree is green, as you can see there. It will also say zero degree on the back side. This has been set up such that the camera is already attached to the scope. This is the light source cord, delivers a light here. And this sheet is the endoscope sheet. And you can see the water is being delivered via this port here. With a zero degree scope, of course, it's looking straight ahead. It does not matter which way you turn the shaft, as you can see here always looking directly straight ahead. As far as um, the scope itself, this blue area here will make the picture on the screen larger or smaller based on the plus or the minus in the microscope as you can see there. Then to get focus with this goldish colored one which you can rotate one way or the other to get the accurate focus uh, for the patient. Now as we transition to our other scopes, the next one up is the 30 degree scope. In the case's operating room, we have a reverse post 30 degree scope, so the post is looking the same direction as the camera. That's very helpful when you're operating, for instance, doing a frontal sinus surgery. You can still pass your instruments below the scope, and the light core is not getting in the way of your hand down below. The next one up is the 45 degree scope, and as you can see here, it's a slightly different setup. Uh, the light post comes out from the side here, and this is now looking up. So it's, a, it's at 90 degrees from the angle of the camera to the light post for the 45 degree scope. Lastly is the 70 degree scope, it's quite an angled scope. In, in the operating room here we do not have reverse post for the 70s. 
So you see here, this is looking up, but the post comes out below. The issue with that in the operating room, again, is that as the cords come down below, it's difficult to pass your instruments through while looking up, in this case. We fairly rarely use a 70 degree scope. Those are our scopes. Um, for navigation, I typically navigate a straight pointer and a curved pointer. It's good for the ethmoid and sphenoid sinus. It's helpful in the frontal sinus. You can also navigate several instruments, including the micro breeder sections as well, and you may come across those during the rotations uh, as well. The next thing I'll mention is our topical decongestant. Uh, I use 1 to 1,000 epinephrine. That's placed on pledgets here. Um, we do some injection on the table, though I don't typically inject very often. These are marked with a fluorescein strip, as you can see here. The reason why I tend to mark my 1 to 1,000 epinephrine with fluorescein is to ensure that it's not being drawn up and injectable and injected into the patient. If you inject 1 to 1,000 epinephrine into the patient, you can have a lot of cardiac issues. And of course, our usual injection is 1% lidocaine with 1 to 100,000 100, epinephrine. So of course, if you get handed a syringe with green or yellow dye in it and you're tipped off it, of course, it's your, not your local. It's the 1 to 1,000 epinephrine, which of course, you do not want to inject into the patient. So it's really, they're, they're dyed for safety reasons. Number of other uh, pieces of equipment, as you can see here, uh, we've got things like back biters, good for the maxillary sinus, they're biting back on themselves. This is the adult size. This is the uh, pediatric terrier back biter, again, biting back on itself, as you can see there. Number of other hand instruments are over here. These are our uh, Blakesley grasping forceps, both the adult size and the pediatric sizes here, straight and 45 degrees, as you can see there. There's a couple other instruments to show. Uh, these are our kerosene rongeurs. As you can see here, on our sets, we typically have a one millimeter, as you can see there, it's very thin. A two millimeter, there, it's upgoing uh, kerosene rongeur with a 45 degree bend on the tip. And this would be a downgoing two millimeter kerosene rongeur as well. Those are the three kerosenes that are usually on the set. Our frontal sinus instruments all have a nice curvature to them, as you can see here. This is called the frontal pediatric kerosene, also known as the cobra. You can see that curvature there to allow us to access the frontal sinus. This would be a uh, similar instrument. It's called the frontal hoseman punch. Again, we see that similar curvature to access the frontal sinus with these style of instruments. The last thing I'll show is some of our uh, suction and suction elevators. These would be um, sort of our standard suctions, as you can see here. They're numbered, of course, with larger sizes being uh, larger and smaller sizes being smaller. They're marked in French as an eight French uh, straight suction. And this would be our suction elevator. I'm um, called a suction freer, as you can see here. This is helpful with dissecting out uh, nasal septal flaps and septoplasty type of uh, surgeries. I wanted to point out a few additional instruments. I showed you earlier the Blakesley graspers, and these are not through cutting instruments. They're simply grasping instruments, as you can see here, with this pediatric straight just to grab tissue and remove it. However, typically when we're dissecting, we tend to use through cutting instruments. They're mucosal sparing instruments. So here's our adult size through cuts and our pediatric size through cuts. The straight adult, the 45 degree adult, the straight peds and the 45 degree peds. As you can see here with these instruments, as I open and close them, they have a lip that actually goes into this lower tine and that will take a cut uh, or cut through the, the tissue. It sh you should also note that if you bury the tissue the whole way to the apex of it, this last little bit doesn't cut very well. It cuts better towards the anterior portion of it uh, when you're using it intraoperatively. So now the patient's been draped too much of our equipment has been brought up. I just want to point out a few things. Number one, we like to have the entirety of the face exposed. Again, the orbit's on both sides to allow visualization and palpation if needed or in the case. And this marker also needs to be available uh, uh, outside of the field in general terms for you to be able to register your instruments as you come in and out with various instruments. As you can see here, um, we don't like to have a lot of uh, cords coming off directly in front of us because they'll tend to be bumped and moved if we stand here. So they're all coming off sort of posteriorly. Some are going to the light source over there and looking around. Others are going to the uh, endo scrub and uh, micro debrider instrument, as you can see there. One thing I do want to point out are the pedals as well, as you can see down here. This is our endo scrub pedal, nicely decorated for room 211 slash 404. This is our micro debrider pedal, as you can see here. And this would be our suction bovie pedal. This is used the least, so we usually scoot this back a little bit. And the scrub is used most commonly, so I keep that closest to me. And then our micro debriders next to that as well. That's uh, pretty much it for the setup and uh, layout of the room. And uh, then it's time to operate.
One thing I'll mention is it's very good to have your pledges in early. That allows things to be decongesting while you're getting set up in the room as Dr. Smith is done here. 